Yep. Is there anything else? We had talked about the MDA framework, uh, the different uh, linkages between simulation um, uh, learning in the widest sense, um, and um, that that we encountered those those, those Venn diagrams that we had uh, about the different disciplines um, that characterize uh, game-based learning as a potential um, ancestor of kind of um, uh, serious games. Yeah. Cool. MDA fra another framework, perhaps. DPE framework, that's right, right? So uh, what was that thing about? And who knows it by heart? Anyway. Because I don't know. I don't know it by heart, of course. But does anyone want to share something about the DPE framework or sometimes referred to as WIN framework as well? That one is slightly more painful, so I'll probably bring it back up. So just to, to, to remind you a bit, in a second, because it's certainly a bit more of an involved one. So let's see. That was that one. Does it jumpstart any ideas? So, I'm just opening the chat so I'm sure I see everything that's possibly posted. Um, so uh, the idea was basically there that it actually kind of falls uh, falls into kind of a similar uh, category, right? So that differentiates between uh, kind of the mechanics from a, from a, from a, uh, um, from different perspectives, or rather the design uh, from from uh, different perspectives, then uh, the play, meaning the interaction of the player with the uh, environment with the um, um, gameplay in a wider sense as available, and then the experience on the part of the player, which would be closely related to, you know, um, I guess in our case, the learning, because uh, looking at serious games, we are primarily concerned about uh, learning and um, um, use everything else as a means to an end, if you like, meaning entertainment is not the primary purpose of serious games, but it's really about uh, um, channeling um, learning through entertainment in a wider sense. And um, the DPE framework is a bit more more complex than the MDA framework for two reasons. Number one is, uh, of course, that uh, the MDA framework is made for um, classical or thought up for classical entertainment games in the first place. So it doesn't have that uh, uh, ob objective, let's say, to, um, you know, categorize and um, focus on learning specifically as one objective of games, but rather uh, thinking about the experience, whatever the objective may be. Whereas the uh, DPA framework is slightly more specific or considerably more specific, to, if you like. And in addition to the categories, uh, design, play and experience, we also have abstractions um, that are means uh, basically to, to, to an end um, to, um, you know, uh, convey information. So the objective, for example, the highest abstraction level is the learning. And it implies that you know about the uh, background uh, theory and as far as pedagogy is concerned as a designer, for example, then how you bring it down, let's say, into a story setting. Um, that makes sense because as humans, we tend to learn uh, best in terms of narratives and stories. Um, and that's really um, the, the kind of skill that the designer needs to bring about and kind of convey as part of the um, game that they develop. Then we have gameplay. And uh, you may have observed that gameplay actually largely characterizes the um, um, uh, categories as we found in the MDA framework, right? So now we're getting, getting actually closer to um, the the, the um, operationalization, meaning the implementation of the game in terms of the mechanics that are available, dynamics and um, effect. And finally, then, of course, user experience. That's really most immediately um, uh, associated with the user itself. Question, um, gameplay. So what's mechanics? Feel free to speak up, feel free to um, text up. Uh, yeah, rules, okay, yep. Anything else more specific about rules, uh, in addition to rules? Rules, definitely right, yeah. Can I be almost anything that is like used as a means of uh, building up the game? So like how the physics works, how, what sort of engine you're using if you didn't make it yourself? Yeah, that's right. So, um, 
Exactly. So basically everything that the game kind of aims to, to aims to represent that may be automated or may operate in interaction, for example, with uh, dynamics, if you like, right? So um, so there's there's quite a bit of um, different forms. Anything that kind of um, um, reflects um, um, abilities to modify the player, uh, the, the behavior outcome of the of the player, but from a perspective of a designer, not necessarily anything the player can directly interact with, right? Perhaps, um, yeah, only indirectly. So um, and uh, dynamics, what was that? Uh, Lama points makes a good point. The gamification part points levels patches. I think you're still referring to mechanics as well. What's the dynamics bit? The dynamics basically the subset, if you like, of the mechanics that the user can directly interact with, right? So that the user can directly affect. So that's actually where play comes about. That the player, for example, you may not be able to change the physical environment, perhaps in the configuration lab. Let's ignore that for now. Uh, but but you may, for example, be able to move the player, right? So or uh, make choices or change player behavior and so on. So that may be quite worthwhile um, uh, considering um, in order to kind of stimulate learning. And then on the uh, end side, what, what would be uh, experience or aesthetics be? Or a music choice, tone. Yeah, all that kind of stuff, right? So visuals, audio, basically anything that stimulates in the widest sense your um, well, at least that's the intuition that um, I usually think about it is in a way, uh, um, you know, um, affects your senses directly, right? So um, um, in, in, in a wider sense, so effect, and that kind of translates into emotions that you associate. Yeah. Can kind of call it an appeal to emotion. An appeal to emotion, that's nice. Oh, that sounds beautiful. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, very good point. So, um, yeah, those are the main important aspects there. So just to bring it back down to one level. So I think the MDA principles uh, should be something that should be quite settled with you guys. You want to be comfortable with this because uh, we'll encounter this um, again. So not, um, again, of course, don't learn those frameworks by heart, but it's worthwhile to know about those frameworks and how they work. And, and, and to some extent, they also represent a certain uh, taxonomy, actually. Uh, and here, uh, specifically, for example, with respect to, uh, to design, from more abstract to more specific, if you like, uh, in as far as relevant for the design of games, if you like, right? And similar for play and experiments. experience, sorry. Cool. Um, so, so we had the high-level perspective on serious games, how they relate with uh, computer games more generally, with simulation, with learning, or you know, um, e-education um, principles, um, principle of game design in a more traditional sense, actually, right? So, because um, uh, serious games build on games technology, but but it, it interacts uh, uh, hopefully sensibly to kind of uh, draw out different uh, features. And today, uh, one, one of the objectives is to, um, let's see if I get this right, um, the, uh, or one, one of the objectives, one aspect that we didn't really look at it so, so, so um, it, it intensely to this uh, stage, is really uh, the mechanics, right? So, and they are quite relevant in order to kind of uh, understand game design, but also uh, make conscious choices about it. But more specifically, um, uh, identify the ones that are relevant for serious games specifically, right? So, um, because there are a lot of mechanics that we could talk about in the context of game design, but they are, uh, may not be as relevant. So the ones that we are talking about um, uh, um, are the ones that are specifically uh, of, of, of value to be considered as part of um, serious games. Um, specifically. And we'll come back to many of those throughout the entire course. So it's important to kind of get a, a feeling what mechanics actually means in, in terms or, or, or in terms of the um, available features um, that are relevant for a uh, or available to a um, game designer in the widest sense. So we can refer to this as the mechanics toolbox in the widest sense to just get an understanding that uh, what what are the topics for discuss. So uh, we should discuss. Um, before I start, are there any mechanics that you could think about that we that um, would be relevant in the context of serious games specifically? When earlier I talked more about general about games, but what about serious games specifically? Any, any mechanics that come to mind? or aspects that are very important. 
And I think uh, Rune alluded to it last time as well. There are certain um, elements that uh, are specifically relevant in the context of CS games. Well, you're yeah, looking for anything relevant, not exclusive to serious games. Not exclusive, because there's always a... Um, well, in in a sense, I, I would um, look for something that's specifically relevant for serious games. It may also be relevant, of course, in regular games. So, But what are typical challenges that you need to watch out for as game designer? I mean, game design, uh, uh, we all uh, will agree and understand that it's, it's not just about, you know, using less tech and um, having, um, you know, um, exploiting features of the hardware in a most efficient way, but there's more to gameplay, right? So, um, but if we talk about it in terms of serious games, what, what is one concern that we want or what, what do we want to achieve using serious games in the first place again? Uh, want to achieve a learning outcome some sort of learning outcome right or behavior change or something like this so in order to have to facilitate this what do we need to ensure that we have a story that we have some story that's right and what is the purpose of the story there well it it, it... It preserves the flow of this of the game. It, uh, it catches the the user and the, or the player and makes it more interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. So you want to captivate the player to some extent, right? So that they're, they're lured into this uh, game and hopefully keep them in the game initially at least for as long as possible, right? So because if you assume that uh, the longer you engage a player with the with the uh, system, the more likely it is that you actually achieve your learning outcome or behavior change or cognitive effects or any sort of learning uh, that is uh, desirable, right? So, I mean, um, you guys are probably aware of this uh, um, uh, uh, rule of thumb that you need to at least spend three weeks on uh, reinforcing behavior change before it actually is internalized and takes place. So this is one of the aspects that relates to it. So that's why there needs to be some way or some means by which we can captivate the user's attention for an extended period. Um, yeah, and mechanics is, uh, spe all the relevant mechanics play, play an important role in order to kind of ensure that people actually commit. Okay, let's go through one, uh, some. So um, there is the, First, probably, it's the concept of balance that we need to discuss. Um, and what what is what what does balance probably mean? Kind of harmony, kind of equal shared energy, and effort. Okay, yeah. So you're thinking about balance in terms of, um, if I get it right, fairness to some extent. Yeah, as well. Okay. And you're, you're actually spot on because it's a very complex problem, right? So, um, or a comp complex concept. So it's, it can't be just simply reduced to, to one turn, you're right. So having some sort of how many interaction uh, distribution of effort, it's, that's an interesting uh, perspective, yes. Um, other views on, on balance? Because it's a complex one. Uh, it might be related to the uh, reward system as well. Like mm -hmm. how rewardful the game is uh, when you complete a set of tasks and what you receive as a, in return, I guess. I see. Yeah. So it relates to the reward system. Yeah. So there's an element of balance. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So why why um why do you think this is important? Um, I mean, if the game is let's say too hard or too easy, both of mm -hmm. those would uh, would make the game either underwhelming or overwhelming for the player. So the interest for the game would drop. This is spot on. Yeah. So balancing is one of the hardest challenges. That's exactly right, as you the way you're suggesting it. So I mean, having a uh, perfect balance in a game, right? So perfect fairness, e equality, or however you want to um, uh, address this, actually is not really helpful for learning because. Um, then suddenly the, 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 the engagement of the game doesn't matter, right? So it's a bit like gambling, if you like, where you basically operate based on chance largely. So uh, largely, so it's usually not, you know, based on skill necessarily. Um, not for all instances of gambling, of course, but 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 in, in the simplest form, if it's purely random choice or something like this, you will simply not have 
any meaningful cognitive engagement other than just you know playing it again and again for for reasons that we talk about in a second but um learning is probably not something you provoke there right so conversely if you have complete imbalance right so for example if uh, you successfully uh, solve a task you get uh, 100 crowns and if someone else successfully completes the same task gets a thousand crowns uh, that's perfect imbalance especially if both parties know about this and then uh, they would simply well one of them in any case but would simply stop playing it right so there's this element of finding the fine line um as well so if you um um coming bring it back to storytelling an important point is um to think about a, a narrative that kind of makes sense and makes it somewhat challenging um so if we were to for example have a health game hang on i'll just respond to some So uh, hang on, yep, so perfect balance gets the game stale, that's correct. And uh, Suraj says, suggests balance is in turn a balance between stability and chaos. Um, to, to, to some extent, you can see it uh, this way, but you, you, you want to, you want to, this is uh, really more from a um, 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 kind of physical system perspective in the widest sense. Here's more about the involvement of the player in the game, right? So it's in, in how far do, um, do do you ensure that pay, players actually you know continue playing the game as opposed to thinking about it like a physical system? But the metaphor holds. Um, Benjamin has another point here. If you have twenty choices, but one is clearly superior, you're effectively only one choice, right? So that's that's also one point about balancing. So if you have a, a, a give the player multiple choices, such as the uh, shown is the ample he, in the example here. Um, um, what is it? Uh, rock, paper, scissors, lizard, um, Spock, right? So um, from from um, uh, uh, now it escapes me just now. From uh, come on, uh, the popular series that ran until uh, two years ago. Um, ah, Big Bang Theory. That's right. So uh, you see, you have a lot of choices, right? But fundamentally, it's just an expansion of choices. But uh, uh, there is no superior. Uh, a choice at all, right? So it doesn't really make much of a difference other than increasing complexity, probabilistic, uh, or uh, the probability of actually uh, having a superior um, a position or choice uh, may may uh, be be smaller for every player. But uh, what I want to get at is um, the other one is storytelling. Um, earlier, when we talked about the DBE framework, it came out that storytelling is so important to keep people people involved. And here, um, the, it's not so much about uh, a matter of chance or um, um, skill in the widest sense, but merely about telling, you know, providing a sensible storyline. If you, for example, have an e-health game. And that e-health game directly and um, you know without much filtering reinforces the best practices you know of how you should um, 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 you know increase your health right by walking 45 minutes per day, eating only carrots and uh, somewhat veggies, and uh, minimizing some sort of um, uh, carb intake uh, beyond a certain amount. And so, on. if it basically just follows doctor's orders in a wider sense, the game will also be uninteresting because it states the obvious, right? You all know this. That's the point here. Um, and uh, similar for, for example, hazard training. I'm not sure if any of you had to do in your past the health and safety training. And uh, in, as a response or at the end, you need to click yourself through a kind of an exam, right? So web-based exam and uh, in, in a multiple choice uh, fashion. And th those can be really un, un, uh, inspiring as well, because in most instances, there's a very obvious choice of what you're supposed to do, uh, which you know does not afford much more than intuition rather than actual learning in the widest sense. So there's no challenge there. And then the argument is there that you actually don't learn much from those ones because you're just you know uh, playing the game literally, as opposed to uh, have a kind of um, additional learning effect that goes beyond it, right? But so the the, the tricky thing is to have a Balance of balance in a wider sense. Uh, that is, you need to have a mild asymmetry in uh, in, in in chance, kind of to to provoke or in 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 in, in um, um, outcomes um, of particular choices. So you provoke uh, some sort of learning, some sort of challenge that uh, is provides the um, player with a certain um, um, level of challenge, potentially even stress to some extent, but it must not be to an extent that it's frustrating for the player. So it's kind of really a fine line as to how to engage individuals with increasing, for example, their performance as opposed to overwhelm them. For example, if you have a health app and um, that starts really easily off and suggests, you know, today we are, you are uh, walking one kilometer in, 
in uh, in a set amount of time and you're suddenly expecting them to uh, run six kilometers the next day in a minimum of amount of time that is probably not a nice uh, or a good way of balancing it because you likely lose the player that actually would have genuine interest in gradually increasing their performance by overwhelming them benjamin you raise the hand please go for it uh, this kind of reminds me about the AI director in Left 4 Dead systems, where they kind of had a player uh, engagement factor or metric to avoid draining the players um, or fatiguing the players by just throwing zombies at them all the time. So they kind of had a, uh, what's it called again? They had a period after every major event where everything was kind of more relaxing. And okay. then it just kind of scaled up again. Okay. I think I have in a second. No, this picture is very bad. But yeah, it kind of followed a participation uh, to maximize the player's engagement and enjoyment without kind of trying to overwhelm them by a constant engagement. So to try to find a balance. Right. And and the supervisor, was it self-learning or was it actually a person? No, it that... was an AI director. AI director, okay. So, okay. I'm trying to find a, there was a few nice um, uh, graphs I saw. And that was mm -hmm. basically, it, it was basically that they had a form of metric that kind of um, uh, quantified how much player engagement uh, there was in the game, and then it would try to increase that again, and then drop the player engagement by spawning less zombies and less encounters, mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. building up again to build right. tension. Right, right. So what? Okay, that's a very good point. So w what was necessary in order to ensure this, to, to to make this work, right? So what is the important point that uh, uh, Left 4 Dead evidently had in uh, the gameplay? I posted a very poor quality picture there. Yeah, uh, but uh, coming back to the point, what, what, what was very important in order to facilitate such an ability? Not entirely sure. Well, they had to constantly monitor player in involvement, right? So that's a very important point, right? So it, it, it sounds intuitive to us. Uh, yeah, that's, that's you can zoom mini, in quite a bit. Miniscule. Um, I see. So let's see. But yeah, as you can see there, the middle one shows the player uh, engagement. Right. And how they change the uh, demanded population. The desired population versus the actual population to fit the player engagement, so they okay. then spaced it out after uh, ma mm -hmm. every major event. Uh, can you just briefly motivate this kind of uh, storyline or the essence of of this game to for people to know what population, how population uh, right, relates? Yeah, in Left 4 Dead, you your goal is to move from point A to B, and then during said. Uh, during the game, you will encounter large or small uh, clusters of zombies, and every event will be kind of random in terms of engagement, difficulty, etc. Which is what you can see at the top there. That is what the game designer kind game designers want the uh, game event to look like. But based on the engagement of the player, the middle graph, they decided to remove some zombies fr uh, from the uh, actual gameplay and that you can see in the uh, graph below. Because I think that the AI director decided that having the actual desired population, the top um, the top line there, would be overkill to for uh, the players and would just fatigue them. Just having constant fighting in for half an hour is quite challenging and draining in terms of stamina etc so they then enforced relaxed periods to despawn enemies okay right yeah so um, that i mean that makes intuitive sense right so uh is, is left footed a serious game game uh not at all but i um <laughs> i just know that they are one of the uh first games i do believe that had right. such a complex ai director mm -hmm. it also made the uh Engagement in said game a lot more fun, meaning that every challenge or level would kind of be balanced around you and the players you were around. 
because mm -hmm. if, for example, if you if you take up the uh, graph again, um, yeah, hang on, yeah, oh yeah, uh, if you say crushed the uh, the first population, it would then scale it up for the next one, I yeah. do believe, because mm -hmm. it would then quantify you as you are a better player. You need more enemies and more stress yeah. in your life. Then it would remove loot, I do believe. Not entirely sure. Okay. And to kind of make force you to get to the top of the curve in terms of engagement. Mm. And I do because you have a lot of factors inside the game that could change around, like special enemies, health, uh, regeneration tools, ammunition, etc. Right. Yeah. That sounds good. So, um, so you have um, kind of elaborated on an example of balance in the terms of. Uh, continuous adaptation of challenge level, right? So in order to meet uh, player capabilities, right? Yeah. So that's that's one forms of um, form of, of 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 balance, and possibly the most important one to some extent, as we'll learn, especially in serious games. Uh, surprisingly, of course, because it's about a learning progress. So we we need to assume that the player is not static in its capabilities, but actually learns in the process. You may not necessarily have that in other games or to a more moderate extent, but in, in serious games, especially over a longer term, we want to assume that, right? So um, very important point. So there are different types of pen. So thank you very much, Benjamin. That's a, it's a good good example actually to throw this in. Um, um, from from the more general kind of games perspective as game developer, that's something you have to watch out for. But the, the, the important point to take away here is that balance comes in various forms, right? So it can be difficulty. That was the example that Benjamin just gave. It can be fairness, right? So it would, wouldn't make sense if there's different forms of reward for the same activity by different players, right? So even though their skills may be different to some extent, um, the, the, the choices, Benjamin also elaborated on this one already in the chat, saying if you have uh, um, inferior choices that you know they actually don't make any sort of difference, those will not be adopted by the player. For example, if you are in uh, have been playing a health app and you have the uh, choice between uh, veggies and two types of junk food, um, then likely any of the choice of junk food will leave you with an inferior option. So they are de facto are basically just one choice because it doesn't really matter if you uh, eat uh, chips or uh, fries or whatever else it would be, um, as opposed to uh, you know having some sort of healthy intake and so on. So choices, even though they're modeled explicitly, may actually be uh, collapsed and reduced you know that you need to um exploit from a perspective of the player what does it actually means um in in terms of having different choices just a different label for the same thing or is it a genuine different option that you uh, may have then there's the element of chance right so um the the the, the idea of having probabilistic elements in a game right so sometimes uh, for example, you you uh, get get a reward for some activity that you perform. Otherwise, other times you you don't, right? So this has an influence on your behavior, as you will see in a second. Uh, mostly informed by uh, social psychology studies, specifically. Um, and um, the other aspect, uh, again linked to difficulty, is the kind of uh, idea of uh, skill and strategy, right? So in how far do you aim for um, the player developing a skill of playing the game? Or a high level, higher level strategy, you know, in 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 uh, in in, in, um, in kind of managing. For example, if you think about a simple game that consists of uh, rounds of, um, uh, uh, you know, um, let's say let's say okay, sticking to the example of a zombie game, if you like, developing increasing skills of uh, uh, killing zombies, but overseeing that you're actually um, uh, wasting your time with killing zombies, but actually supposedly should um, also perform other tasks that you know uh, enhance your player capabilities uh, and so on. So not blindly committing to only the skill-centered activity, but also have a strategic thinking about how to uh, develop um, um, you know um, broader opportunities in, in 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 the game if they exist. I don't know. Um, then this may be an option. So, for example, if you are thinking about cognitive development, it's probably a better one. You have the option of, for example, focusing on math games exclusively or uh, also engage in other uh, cognitive learning activities related to, for example, uh, uh, linguistics and so on. So uh, having your portfolio of skill sets developed strategically may be more valuable than honing one specific skill only, right? So that's one of them. 
Um, so the other ones, uh, for instance, you know, they, they, of course they are all somewhat overlapping, but nevertheless worth by reflecting on briefly uh, the idea of being, you know, competitiveness. So you need to ensure that you en engage the player to an extent that it's interesting to be engaged in, but not again, uh, kind of uh, scare, uh, scaring them off, and also allowing them to kind of uh, be successful against other players. And this is quite tough, especially if you think about. Um, uh, 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 um, online games where you mix players without any prior knowledge about their um, conditions, about their abilities and so on. Benjamin, you raised the end, I believe. Yes. Uh, uh, dragging the Left 4 Dead uh, example back to a more serious game, though, I do believe that one of the Wii Sports, that's a serious game, uh, basically tracked player progress uh, and then graphed the skill level and increased, etc., to kind of chart. Pardon me. Chart the uh, chart the the skill level and skill increase and improvement for the player. I'm not entirely familiar if it did anything in terms of game difficulty, mm -hmm. or just informed the player about his current skill level and potentially informed them about what they should uh, do to improve the, their skill level. Not entirely mm -hmm. sure how much to monitor you inside the game. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, sometimes this 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 distinction between skill and strategy is not as pronounced in entertainment games, but in, in serious games, it would be more relevant, perhaps. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like I don't think they change the difficulty of bowling, for example, based on the skill level, because it the game is basically static. Yeah. The only thing improves and changes is you. Yeah. So um, yeah. I, I follow. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so um, perhaps, um, of course, the other other aspects of balance include that you don't want to, for example, over um, um, kind of want to don't want to over um, um, you know reward players. So there is a reward inflation uh, or akin to that that will also uh, demotivate players for further um, participation. The length needs to be balanced. For example. Uh, if you think about uh, you know those lectures here, we also need to have regular breaks. Otherwise, um, that's actually not manageable and kind of um, by 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 you know the players, participants, or listeners in the wider sense. Uh, freedom of choice. Too much choice is not a good idea. Too little choice also not right. So it's this openness. I mean, we have a mix. For example, um, again, no reference to serious games here. But if you think about open world games, they have this mix that you have two distinctive strategies where you're more roaming, exploring, some massive amount of freedom, but probably limited challenge level other than exploring as opposed to a uh, you know um, story narrative or storyline which you need to follow and uh, are constrained of course in your choices but also receive more challenges um, the other aspect is um, that you need to meet um, and all those aspects in the end they kind of respond to this you need to respect uh, player types so um, some player may be more inclined to just follow um, instruction as provided as part of the gameplay, whereas others are actually not constrained to seek, for example, um, this based on uh, imagination, right? So um, that's that's uh, one, one distinctive um, aspect that needs to be uh, involved um, there. Um, yep, so is there anything else in the chat I want to um, bring it up? Power creep must be avoided. Mitigated all time. So there are some 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 um, game terms that are embedded. How about ads is included too? Well, ads is not something you want to generally consider as part of a gameplay. They are monetization. That's a different problem. Um, that's outside of the. Uh, yeah, or at least I don't see the linkage to ads. That's interesting for the designer uh, in order to 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 have a profit stream. We talk about this at the end, um, but not so much in order to engage the player. Let alone serious games. Um, that's certainly not an objective. Um. So just, just a few words on symmetry, because uh, we have an intuitive understanding that there's some sort of fairness and interaction and so on. But I think um, uh, when we think about uh, symmetry, there are various forms. And in fact, it's in, in many instances, it's actually hard to attain or retain symmetry in all instances. If we think about, for example, uh, you know, those, those um, more classical um, um, multi-round kind of shooter games, the arena style games, I think that's the way to put it. Um, the idea is there that you know players are randomly positioned in some sort of map or um, an environment, and then you know need to kind of fight each other. And the idea is there that they have a somewhat similar or symmetric start position, that they have the uh, identical choices, for example, equal visibility uh, and so on, identical forces and capabilities. So that would be the ideal way of creating a balance between players. 
um, because especially if you're relying on the player's skill only, you can assume that you have mild asymmetry built in in the first place, right? Because they will not buy, especially in online settings or multiplayer settings, not have the same kind of skill level. So um, you have this um, sufficient um, differentiation in, 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 in skill and ability to kind of promote a, a um, um, successful play. But even that, I mean, asymmetry is unavoidable. It may be based on technical uh, issues such as lag or connectivity, of course, in the, in the worst case. But even if you don't have this, for example, like in traditional games such as chess monopoly, there is by necessity some sort of asymmetry because um, there are predefined um, uh, starting positions, right? So for example, uh, generally the first player move advantage uh, is is to be considered in, in chess, for example, right? So that um, um, the, the white player begins first. And uh, we see it more pronounced in sport games where it's actually quite explicit and known to the players and anyone else, the home uh, versus away, home and away kind of effect that you, uh, you know, uh, shuffle around in order to kind of retain a balance because it's an unavoidable asymmetry unless they would both all play in empty stadiums as they largely have done, I think, this year, uh, or last year, rather, so um, in, in soccer and football, for example. Uh, I'm not sure what effect that would have. There would be an interesting study. But in any case, this home away effect is quite well known, pronounced in, in all kinds of sports. So um, how do you balance this? Well, you, you, you have iterations, right? So that's the idea. Um, some examples here just to visualize it uh, uh, of, the, of different games. And there's, of course, more like those tech examples that are quite uh, uh, known um, and, and some people can relate possibly to. But um, there, there are also games that are perhaps more interesting, like at uh, Tafel games, where actually, as far as I understand, actually Nordic games that are an equivalent in earlier um, or um, um, they're effectively preceding um, chess as a popular board game um, and kind of a standard board game if you like and tougher games the idea there was basically uh, that you don't have symmetry in fact you have someone who defends a particular position and someone who attacks a particular position so it has kind of a chess style layout but it's a explicit and clearly pronounced asymmetry in the game right and the only way to balance this is basically to shift players and play multiple rounds so everyone has a fair chance at uh, either uh, assuming the defense or attack position in this particular uh, game. Does anyone know this, especially the ones that are from Norway or uh, from other Scandinavian countries? Did you hear about Tafel games before? Because I hadn't, admittedly. Okay, so it's just, uh, yeah, I don't know, an interesting observation that is uh, quite fitting, but it, it, it perhaps literally it may, the, 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 or the, the, the fact that it's not as prominent anymore, or perhaps not prominent at all anymore, may actually be related to the fact uh, that it's asymmetric by design. Anyway, um, so yeah, so that, those are some of the aspects. So the, the key point here is then uh, an, uh, to, to, to have some sort of meta balancing going on, right? So you need to play, if you can't, fully balanced, you need to play multiple sessions or enforce the play of multiple sessions where you can. And chess is quite straightforward uh, that you, you know, iterate and then combine the rounds uh, of a revanche, things like this. Um, and tennis, that's also done by changing who's serving effectively and so on. So that's uh, the idea. So change the environment or adapt the environment or uh, player positions in order to uh, ensure that there's some sort of meta balancing. So it's also quite kind of clever way because you ensure a mild asymmetry within a given round. So it's sufficiently attractive and interesting enough to actually play. So you don't have quite the same chance, but across the entire game, no one can complain because all of them had, you know, the rough, um, um, you know, minuscule advantages over others uh, in, in a given uh, round. So that's the um, um, that's the idea of meta balancing, which is quite an important point. Again, this only works in round based games. So you need to think about, uh, of course, what kind of serious games you have. You think about e-health, for example, or learning abilities. Um, if you conceive this as a, as a as a multiplayer game, then you could probably think about a multi round approach uh, in which you have um, um, different challenge levels, but of course you can't repeat the content, unlike in chess where you can play exactly the same game again. In uh, cognitive uh, games, you can't really do that because you have, a, you know, by definition, a strong learning effect. Um, so that's also a challenge because then you need to find a way of balance uh, uh, even uh, multi-session play, which is um, a, a challenge in its own right, of course. And um, so how do you figure this out? How do you get this right? Any ideas?
It's a catch question. Uh, what problem are we solving now? Are we balancing. Solving the How do you get yeah. balancing right? How do you do it? Balancing. Over how do you do, how how do you develop a game design a game and then convince that the balancing is about okay testing yes testing. very good testing yeah testing so how would you how you how would you um, set up this kind of play testing the answer is correct but uh, let, let's dig a bit deeper I guess some form of beta testing where participants have no idea what the game is about and then they are explain what the game is and they uh, have like play sessions. And, mm -hmm. and afterwards, they give their feedback. And uh, are there particular aspects you would consider about the players as part of the play testing? I guess they, they'd have like focus groups, like which players they, they'd want to address. If they are making a game for a certain group, then they, they'd expect that those testers are actually from that group, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have uh, you have the focus effect that you uh, get the right target audience for your game, right? So I think that's a very sensible point in context of game design. Yeah, cool. Benjamin, comment? I uh, I think you were kind of putting up to that, but um, in terms of what players you want to test it on, testing mm -hmm. on yourself or using the same testing group multiple times might be very bad in the long term because they will inherently gain skills mm -hmm. or learn things uh, during the play. And especially, what what's the saying again? If you find your your own game perfectly challenging, it's probably way too hard for the normal person, because you know the game inside and out. And if you have like ten testers that you keep on, just mm. keep reusing, they will also just gain skills. Yeah. The answer is basically just tracking everything and then potentially releasing it in alpha or beta testing and continuously balancing it. Yeah. But every major game ever keeps balancing things all the time and keeps breaking things. And so yes. yeah, they can't so for, find a perfect balance. Mm, yep. So um, that's right. So perfect balance is generally also a challenge. So there's two ways, right? One of them is, of course, the classical maths way of kind of, you know, assigning here, for example, you have a game that consists of multiple units, right? You can buy those units and they have certain strengths, weaknesses, uh, and so on, right? So you have certain costs associated with this, but you get some payoff in terms of weaponry, speed, armor, whatever else. So that uh, emulates a kind of simulation, uh, you know, war style simulation setting. And then you can basically add it up in terms of what does it mean, uh, uh, you know, that there's a net pair of that's slightly negative for the tank. So, but fundamentally, you could need to kind of uh, find a way of balancing this. But ultimately, that's that's uh, uh, right. In particular, Benjamin's comment is really helpful there that uh, you need to um, abstract from yourself as a player, especially if you are a designer of the game in the first place, because you kind of know the mechanics, right? So you're not the play uh, or the game is not uh, played from a perspective of uh, um, um, the, the player experience, the aesthetics, or the dynamics perspective, as we talked about in the MDA framework, that's direction in the way, but you're actually still playing it from perspective of a designer, right? So it's the same as if a, um, you know, alpha tester basically tests their own programs they have developed before rolling them out to the future users, which may be embedded in a different domain, have different knowledge and so on, right? So something that you are, uh, I think all of you are very acquainted with, uh, be it from the design perspective or computer science perspective, in as far as software development is concerned. But um, that, that's certainly a challenge. But the fundamental premise is that similar uh, or play, players with similar capabilities should have a similar chance uh, to win. That's something you need to figure out. And that's part of the game playtesting as well. You know, what is the right challenge level for a uh, player that's within the target audience? Play, target player group. If it's open-ended, you need to have a representative distribution. So if you have a health game and you want to uh, have this open-ended both for uh, uh, young people uh, as well as um, probably older people, then you kind of need to have a representative um, uh, test group and kind of ensure that the game balances uh, itself for all those kind of um, test groups. And here it's really about this, this constant feedback loop that's quite essential in order to be able to adjust the game or adapt the game and its challenge level um, at runtime. So, um, okay. So one of the points is that you don't necessarily, in conventional games especially, it's pretty hard to mitigate the unfairness of situations that emerge based on player choices. So at that stage, you need to let go. That's not something you can really uh, control anymore. You, you can, of course, find a mechanism of nudging players back into 
uh, choices that make more sense are more favorable for them. But fundamentally, the, the idea is that you provide the initial starting point and then let the play take it, its course. And the idea is that over meta games, the players should actually learn. Um, one aspect that is really important uh, to highlight, and this is really important for serious games, uh, is uh, player capabilities in terms of handicaps. So some people may actually simply not be able to interact as freely or as uh, quickly, for example, with devices and so on, or have other impairments that you know uh, don't allow them to uh, perform um, you know as designed originally. If you think about it, a fitness app, for example, but you're dealing with someone who has a um, uh, I don't know, some sort of lung underfunction or something, you will probably not have the health increases or performance increases you would have otherwise firstly. And second of all, you may not want to increase the challenge level as radically as you and may want to do it with a uh, person that has, for example, healthy lung function, if you like. So um, your, your balancing also needs to accommodate player capabilities, but it, it's then enabling as well. If you have a multiplayer setting and you make it, of course, adapted to the capabilities of the respective players, uh, you still allow the players effectively to compete even though one of them has uh, 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 more limited physical capabilities than the other one. So suddenly you're, you're actually um, uh, creating an engaging environment that wouldn't have happened in the pure physical setting. If you, let's say, you know, have uh, uh, people with uh, dissimilar um, uh, physical capabilities to, you know, run a race or whatever else uh, metric you want to apply, uh, you would not, you know, um, provide a challenge level to either of them rather than uh, frustration or boredom by on either side. But using serious games, you may actually be able to kind of balance it throughout the game or within the game and then keep both of them engaged. And this is the magic um, when it comes to open, um, uh, open ended multiplayer games that involve multiple parties. OK, um, I think we need a break. I'll just check the chat again. It's probably reminding me of the game is that. Um, da -da -da. I'll go through the set, chat after, uh, afterwards, see if there's some relevant aspects to be discussed. But I think, shall we have the break uh, until, boom, boom, boom. OK, now I need to give it uh, 15 past, quarter past uh, one. So everyone can recover from my fast talking. Sure, uh, what's yeah. that, seven minutes? Yep, is that enough? That's fine. With yes. Me. Cool. OK, see you then. So we just talked about um, the idea of balancing as a meta problem in, in, in any sort of game, specifically, of course, in serious games, when it's about uh, dealing with um, player capabilities, um, adaptiveness over time. So the player hopefully learns, uh, you know, be it cognitive activities or behavioral changes and so on over time that the system needs to accommodate. Um, uh, Benjamin provided some examples from the area of, of uh, more traditional multiplayer gaming, if you like, where the system itself can moderate this at large, especially if there's a multiplayer setting involved. But this, um, uh, in order to kind of achieve this balancing, there are multiple assets that, that need, need to be taken into account because there's a certain complexity that makes the game exciting, right? So if you're only one choice, uh, uh, that is relatively um, 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 uninteresting. But if you think about chess, for example, you have um, a, a plethora of choices at any given round, right? Because you can choose which um, um, figure to play in the end and uh, also, of course, accommodate their possible uh, movement patterns and so on, right? So within the definition of the game. So choice is an important factor. But uh, in as much as that is the case, um, the other aspect that you in, in games that you often have and more so is the idea of currency because it can also have a balancing impact um and uh, the the idea is that it, uh, you you may in some instances want to allow a, a different form of interaction of the players and that may not just be based for example on uh, competition, meaning you know, one win, one wins, one loses, and so on. Um, but um, also uh, the the idea of engaging player as both to, for example, you know, monetize on the game, of course, but also for the players to engage in a social environment where they trade, interact, and so on, where the player, where the currency, for example, has meaning in the context of the game as a coordination tool, right? So resource redistribution. You are, you know, if you think about an economic uh, simulation, you can buy from other players and so on. So not just to have a competitive setting. So currency can have multiple functions there as well. 
uh, in, in, in this particular uh, setting. And they're, they're diverse as well uh, with respect to their um, uh, value. So sometimes uh, currency is used or I've used, if you like, for the sake of cosmetics in the widest sense. Uh, um, you know, you can upgrade your player or uh, change the aesthetics, the outfit of the player. So examples would be GTA 5 or Fortnite. Um, you can also just bluntly um, uh, um, use the, the idea of currency as a means to uh, pay, overcome your shortcomings and simply play, pay to win in a wider sense. So you can have a shortcut there to buy new um, uh, Pokemons or whatever else you can do in different games. Uh, the, the idea of buying uh, uh, loot crates. So there is a mix between um, providing uh, buying additional capabilities, but not exactly knowing what they entail. So there is a bit of a probabilistic element in there, which kind of keeps it somewhat, I guess, interesting to some extent. But they have often been associated with uh, gambling. So there are various laws in different, uh, at least European countries, at least Belgium, I'm aware of, but perhaps some others as well, uh, where uh, loot boxes are actually banned because of their highly addictive, um, 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 you know, uh, potential. Um, because you don't quite know what you get. So it's very interesting or very um, um, uh, motivating to kind of play again and try again, you know, until you get the loot box you actually want, for example, right? And then, of course, the the, uh, the last one is the one that I mentioned before, having in-game currency. So you can actually trade exchange and create a bit of a community sense, a collaborative and coordinative uh, value within the game. So the, play the players are not just playing in isolation, but compare themselves via leaderboards and so on, as you would think about in terms of a competitive setting more. But actually, you can also have a collaborative setting that you can create, you using those um, currencies. And uh, you can possibly even extend this beyond a particular game, right? Um, I'm just checking. So yeah, there's uh, there's some some bit, bit I'm just following briefly the chat, a uh, bit disruptive, but feel free to speak and perhaps share if needed or if sensible, because there's a reference to the linkage in real world to real world currency. So sometimes that you know game can extend into the real world, which is of course a challenging one as well, both on a, a, a legal side, but also on a for particular from an ethical side. You know how far you should carry this into the real world. So there are constraints around it, but I think what is probably more relevant here in the context of serious games. Uh, and 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 uh, design is that currency can have a function of creating a community, right? So uh, because you have some meaning or some reason or some potential to interact uh, based on some sort of uh, shared entity, and that's uh, currency, especially in economic settings um, such as uh, um, classical, you know, um, agricultural simulation, if you like, but or like FIFA where you can buy um, soccer stars and so on. So there there is this option uh, potentially. Um, as well. So yeah, there's quite a bit of a, a lateral discussion going on. I'm not going into that right now. I just want to, ah, yeah, uh, one thing I wanted to show that may actually be quite, um, uh, quite, quite interesting to some of you. Um, yeah, no, okay, we get back to that later. Yeah. So, but the idea is um, to be aware of the associated uh, dynamics that uh, come with this, right? So, what what is the intention of the designer to some extent? For example, if it's about cosmetics, it becomes very obvious that, that the designer merely wants to monetize on the game and having you know a minuscule change for the player, but no advantage in the game. So, let next to no game effect unless you assume that aesthetics have a difference or have an impact on the uh, um, offending player, the the opposing opposing player if you like. But some of them, of course, have a strong influence of the player experience, such as the in-game currency specifically, right? So if you want to uh, uh, leverage engagement, particularly, this is very helpful. If you just want to um, ex engage the player, but not necessarily have the player interact, uh, so at least not as stimulated by currency, your loot crates are a good idea here. And that's, of course, a very cheap way of uh, for the player to buy their way out of actually interacting with the dynamics of the game and the challenge level, and a very easy way for the designer or the, 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 the producer of the game in the widest sense to earn, to monetize. Um, cool. So there, if anyone is interested in some practical examples, I think just follow the chat. There's something going on there that's worthwhile following, I believe. Uh, if you if you want to follow, uh, seek more examples that are taken, I think from the game world primarily. So the other point is, uh, uh, of course, you know, points which allow you to have some sort of explicit 
um, um, comparison uh, between players. So it's not so much about interaction, but it's actually reinvoking uh, or, or uh, having a mechanism to represent um, um, the, the, the achievements. And it can be linked to competitiveness, but that's linked to the question as to whether you distribute point information or not, right? Do you know how you fare compared to others, for example, in a one-to-one -one setting? Or for example, you just know that you fare better than 20% of all players or 80% of all players and so on. Or are you actually explicit about having a leaderboard that even identifies individuals. So this can evoke different forms of competitiveness. One of them being, for example, more abstract, um, but preventing any interaction. And the other one more concrete, but uh, provoking rivalry, for example, right? So if you want to beat the first placed one in leaderboard, you know, that's the guy you kind of have your eye on, um, as opposed to when you know, oh, you're, you're, you're um, you know, 80% bet, uh, no, you're better than 80% of the players of the game, you know, okay, you want to get to, you know, 90%, but you don't have this explicit, uh, uh, competition that is targeted at one individual in particular. Um, so the other thing is that uh, we get slowly or slower to is uh, or slowly move towards is the idea of reward structures because they are very important when we think about uh, the the um, the idea of having a um, um, you know, uh, attraction to the game and maintain a player's interest in the game specifically, right? So, and um, one one famous example is, um, of course, the um, the Skinner box. Does anyone want to share how the Skinner box works or has some intuitions about how this thing works? Yeah, uh, an intuition at least because I don't re Please. remember the exact specifics. So, sure. you you have some sort of. Uh, outlet or interaction point and um, where you interact with it, let's say push a button and then there's a chance that you get a reward for doing it not exactly 100 guaranteed but sometimes you get a reward for pushing that button yeah so uh, what's what's this business with the sometimes because if the outcome is pre one predictable uh, it becomes boring so it is mixing in a bit of entertainment with your the thing you want yeah um so it becomes boring what's the other effect boring is probably right here right because you, you have a mechanical a causal relationship right pressing the button releases something so in this case it's a red that when you press the button it actually releases a uh, foot pellet probabilistically or gets an electric shock. So not the kind of experience you would want to get, want to will get ethical approval for nowadays, but the kind of experiments that kind of highlight the effects more explicitly. And that's are still referenced. Uh, in, I, I'm not sure when it was done, probably in the 60s. Most of those cruel experiments were done in the 60s anyway. Um, but but um, so in addition to boring, what's the other problem with um, Benjamin? Uh, super addicting in terms of dopamine rewards. Yeah, in terms that people can get addicted to the good feeling of getting a good drop out of random chance. Yeah, that's right. This is, has been seen a lot due to a new gacha game uh, hitting Twitch and YouTube, where people literally open or uh, open boxes and put it out on YouTube and make millions of rewards, and the good drop rates are like below one percent. Yep. Yeah, 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 that's right. So people play and want to be the lucky one. That's right. Um, yeah. So um, this is a good example, but it still doesn't answer my question. Why is that problematic? Uh, the, the, the gambling aspect aside, uh, or why why is a one to one causal relationship uh, um, uh, not effective in the context of serious games? Uh, Jon Gunnar, for change. Uh, Perhaps not uh, exactly uh, what you were thinking about, but the, they put like a price tag per uh, attempt you get at the getting reward. Mm -hmm. Okay. They, they de facto you're pricing the reward. Okay. That's one aspect. I agree. Yeah. But you could still calculate this based on your past experiences, right? So if you had by chance, probabilistically, would accumulate a reward, you could calculate what the price uh, would be for the reward. Benjamin, is there a lateral comment you want to make? Uh, re regarding what you just said, I think that mm. most gacha games or loot box games need to like legally publish drop rates now, which wasn't a thing like five years ago. But, let's put the legalistic perspective a bit aside. I'm still oh. let's let's stay on the theory a bit. Oh, oh yeah, uh, I was gonna go back to that, but you but, just 
you mentioned drop rates and calculations, and that is uh, quite a new thing due to Belgium and China pushing for more legislation. So a lot of what we're currently talking about might be void in two or three years because mm. everything is, is changing, especially mm. with Belgium banning stuff. Mm. But I think that if you kind of make people addicted to the good feeling of getting a good reward from a Skinner box system, you might then encourage people to game the system to get as much uh, openings or being able to open as many boxes as possible mm. or trying to find ways to maximize the, the drop they get. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that's a side effect, but you're thinking too deep. Perhaps uh, another intuition, perhaps with someone else. Just, uh, just what, what you know? What's the problem with the causal relationship between a button press and the reward? What's the problem with this? In the context of serious games, what do we want in serious games? What we won't get? Is there someone else who wants to? Because Benjamin will dominate the session otherwise. In fact, he does already. Any ideas? Benjamin, then, if no one else wants. There is no challenge. You press a button and what you do is completely random or what you get is random. So there's no interactivity. There's, yeah, there's the, that's the boring argument. Okay, I want to there's make There's no skill then. Well, well, chance doesn't necessarily mean skill in the first place. It's more about skills, about engagement here, right? So yeah. we want to press a button and probabilistically get something in return. The button press itself is not a particular skill because it's like a, a given as part of the uh, you know start of the game, if you like, in a way. Since no, the point is a different one. If you have a causal relationship between input and output, you will um, also accommodate this and internalize this as a mechanical relationship. And as soon as that happens, you will. Uh, once this uh, mechanism, for example, if the red was used to the fact that well, uh, they would always get a food pellet every time they press the uh, green button or uh, button in the first place, um, then uh, it would also stop as soon as no food pellet would be dispensed anymore. Right. So what does it mean for serious games? Well, for serious games, it would mean as soon as if you have a one to one relationship, so, uh, you know, um, a, a mechanical relationship, causal relationship, the people would basically um, stop engaging in some sort of behavior change as soon as they would stop playing that game. Right. So but what's the what's the objective of serious games? Anyone open question. What's the objective? That you uh, internalize it and that the learning stretches beyond the game. Precisely, precisely. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, that's precisely the point, right? So it's not about the game, it's about the effect of the game in the long term, right? And if you make your user behavior contingent on the continuous interaction with the game, your serious game failed, right? Because they, as soon as they stop playing that game, they're effectively lost, unless you want, to play the, want them to play the game for the rest of their life, which may be an interesting objective from a monetization perspective and certainly an objective for conventional game designers, but not one for serious game designers generally, right? So that's the main point. The probabilistic uh, uh, output helps reinforcing hopefully positive behavior, unfortunately a lot of negative behavior, because that's basically the entire theory on which, uh, you know, the idea of those uh, uh, coin machine is based on, that the probabilistic output will people make people addicted uh, addictive and they embed or people generally have a normative understanding of randomness. So when they think about randomness, they think about dependency between different, different button presses. Meaning if I don't press, if I press the button right now, I don't get a reward. I will need to, uh, I need to get my, my chances of getting a reward next time round will be higher, right? Because they perceive uh, as this, this round basically uh, as a non-success round. So eventually at some stage, I need to actually get a success uh, full drop of rewards, foot pellets, or, you know, some sort of uh, uh, points or whatever else it would be in the game, right? So, but what we don't internalize well is a, the independence between the random draws. Right, so we could have you know five thousand uh, uh, non-reward activities before you get the first reward activities. By that time, of course, the player would be exhausted and certainly not play anymore. But it would violate the normative understanding of randomness that we uh, get that that randomness is balanced out over shorter um, periods, time spans. But we don't know those time spans, right? It could well be you know a, a balance over two years, but we expect a balance of the, over thirty minutes, if you like, right? So there's this challenge there. Uh, and that makes it so attractive for us to continue playing repeatedly, right? Even though we uh, we should know that any random draw is independent of the previous one, right? So there is no interaction between those ones. Does it make sense to everyone? 
if it doesn't make sense, I'm happy to kind of explore that further or feel free to uh, uh, contextualize it further so it makes sense for you. That's very important, I think. So uh, yeah, feel free. I mean, even after the session, you feel, oh, I didn't get, get this kind of, we'll also iterate over some of the concepts uh, next session in the beginning. I always have a bit of a review going on. So I want you guys to kind of pick up on those ideas because that's that's the essence for serious games. Probably one of the most important aspect of uh, a design or mechanics that you want to consider when designing serious games, if you want to deal with challenge and continuous reinforcement, right? So that's the, that's the uh, uh, idea. So don't generate sort of an inference of a causal relationship. So the feeling that, you know, this button and this output is mechanically linked, right? This one-to-one -one relationship, because then you lose the player uh, as soon as you drop, drop um, um, uh, stop playing basically the game. Cool. All right. Um, so reward structures are very important that they are sort of probabilistic. Um, and they can be of different kind, right? Right now we saw the red pressing a button, they get food pellets. That's the obvious one, and it kind of uh, it kind of norms it to energy intake, I guess. But there there's other forms of um, the the the, uh, the reward structure is important because um, it is inf informed by certain other um, you know disciplines and information, but also can express itself in various forms, right? So, I mean, uh, we need to, for example, as um, game designers, be aware of um, the um, 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 research in the area of psychology in as far, for example, of motivation of individual players is uh, concerned. How do we keep players engaged? I think in the next session or the session thereafter, um, we'll talk a bit about some psychological theories that you want to think and learn about a bit more just to you know, see how people uh, uh, feel a reward and also to have a bit of a theoretical grounding for serious games analysis. So if you look at serious games, you can see, okay, what kind of, you know, psychological model do they possibly link to or build on? Um, there's, of course, the, you know, there can be very moderate, moderate uh, notion of reward, such as mere praise, right? So, you know, that the game in some way or another, either as an NPC, a non-player character, uh, or otherwise uh, receives reward. Points, of course, um, there could be prolonged play. Sometimes, you know, if you have certain timeouts for games that you need to reach certain thresholds, when you do that, you get a reward in in, in terms of extending the session, which can be desirable. Um, it can just be curiosity fulfillment. So you, you find something, you you know, you, you, you learn something, learn a fact or some sort of uh, insight. Um, or you, you have a new opportunity for exploration if you're interested in exploration as a player, for example, you know, opening a new, um, I don't know, um, section of the map in a way, sense, things like that. There uh, can be items, powers, additional resources. Um, that's an interesting one, just touching on this one. Uh, so you can provide players with resources. Um, and uh, just want to highlight here that this, the resource perception and understanding is not uniform across uh, players uh, uh, on, on a global scale, right? So, uh, and um, for example, if you think about resources as um, being um, subject to the different levels of fulfillment that you, for example, have. So um, we, we can, for example, reference the Maslow's hierarchy of, need, hierarchy of needs. Uh, who is acquainted with this concept? Just uh, give me a brief rundown because I forget this every time. So I rely on you. Please, no one. What was the question again? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What's the idea of Maslow? The hierarchy um, of needs. You probably heard that somewhere. Uh, uh, is it the ones that uh, the features can be separated into features that must be in there, uh, features that could be in there, or that are not super important, and then features that can be added later or something like that? Uh, I believe it's um, um, about like the psycho. Um, as a human being, we have needs. So we have a uh, first psychological needs, uh, sorry, physiological needs, like um, just the basic needs to survive. So air, water, um, food and stuff. And then there's the safety, such as like uh, feeling safety, feeling safe in your environment, having um, employment resources, um, just safety as a human being from your environment. And then um, there's uh, love, uh, like uh, it's more like an emotional, um, yeah, uh, and then self-respect, and then there's like self-actualization. 
So it's about, so it's a pyramid, right? So um, the most basic needs are like the physiological and then the say, so yeah, it's about um, how in the development of humans, uh, the things that we need the most, uh, uh, like the basic things that we need to function properly. Great. Yes, exactly. Thank you. That's that's exactly right. So, you know, so we have the idea is basically that leans are not uniform, but uh, situationally embedded, right? So if you have certain uh, needs that are satisfied, you know, food or shelter, classical one, physiological needs, right? So that's something we, we deem most important first. Uh, the second one is then only we care about security, you know, and safety in, in the widest sense. And so and then expand from there and have more social needs and, uh, uh, um, have, have, you know, um, realize ourselves. So a lot of um, um, a, a lot of economic literature kind of is, is based on those principles in a sense that we can only have well-performing societies if we allow or provide people with those basic fundamental needs. So how does it translate back to games in a way is um, the, the, the point that I want to make is there that um, resources need to be relevant, situationally relevant as rewards. So if you have a player that has an abundance of, abundance of food, for example, provide even more food, guess what? That reward have a very minuscule effect, right? But if you, for example, uh, allow the engagement in social activity by providing, for example, in a game setting currency and something, then this will be relevant, but will only be relevant if you know safety needs are met first and they can't be satisfied by that particular resource, right? So it's important to bear in mind that there is a bit of a linkage as well, especially if the game is complex, multi-layered, and uh, you know has some sort of adaptive progression. So you need to ensure that the reward corresponds to the situation the player is in. That's the main important point. But understanding um, I, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs is really useful because it can also uh, relate on a wider scale to think about you know what serious games is most relevant for people in different situations, right? So uh, you know, I, is it more like a cognitive? Uh, um, uh, a development uh, uh, um, and, a game that you want to play, you better ensure that people are actually in the space to, um, you know, to be willing and able to actually engage in this, right? Otherwise, you probably need to think about more uh, fundamental uh, skills that you want to want to want to teach as part of a serious games in order to have, you know, have people uh, move into this um, zone of um, comfort um, or into this particular level, right? So if you have uh, physiological needs, I don't think people have much space for playing serious games on this one right so but if you have basic needs satisfied then you have a better chance of uptake in as far as relevant um, and for example if you have individuals that uh, have challenges engaging in social uh, act you know based based on uh, preconditions or whatever else uh, kind of to engage in social activity um, so you're thinking more about health games in a way, then the serious game is, of course, you know, very well targeted to those particular, uh, should be targeted to those particular people, whereas, let's say, cognitive skills may actually be unproblematic for those individuals, but may be interested for ones that are interested in self-actualization. Actual, actual, actuation, I believe. Anyway, but you follow the idea roughly. So, so resources need to correspond to uh, the player state in a wider sense. Um, cool. All right. Yeah. Some some an interesting phenomenon as well is that uh, rewards can just be the indication of completion. So if you tell a player, hey, you only completed 20% of the game or 98, they may be just driven to kind of continue based on this one, right? So there's this continuation idea as well. This is used, for example, questionnaire design as well, that you use a progress bar to indicate people where they are in the game, which is kind of give reassurance and usually also commitment to con uh, uh, continuation. Because if you have uh, completed, let's say, more than 50% of a survey already, it's more likely that you actually pull through all the way to the end. And that's similar uh, for serious games. So there's a lot of different factors. And this is not a finite list, so a, a non-exhaustive taxonomy, as Jon Gunnar would say, and um, but uh, just some pointers that you can think about. So it's not as linear as to saying we're using points and therefore uh, we give some sort of rewards, right? So it's not as uh, linear. The aspect, uh, another aspect to kind of be aware of is this, this, this. Um, Accommodating different player types in terms of their willingness to take uh, to take risk, um, and uh, the idea is that you know if you have a situation where you have uh, players or a situation where you have low rewards and high rewards, um, that you can allow uh, a corresponding mapping of you know the player to the risk they want to take, right? So you put in a moderate amount of money, for example, but you also have a moderate amount of gain or a significant amount of money with the uh, you know conversely higher 
um, probability of actually gaining or losing something. But I actually wanted to show you uh, for two reasons um, a, a video. Let's see if I can dig this out. It's a bit older already. And perhaps some of the game designers amongst you, the ones that actually uh, did this before, um, in, in as part of the bachelor may know this one, but it really talks about choices and challenge and balancing in the widest sense. So I just wanted to bring this up and see if I can play this via the um, hang on uh, can, can play this via Zoom. I probably need to get the settings right, and I need your help to kind of ensure that it actually works out. But just let me bring this up and then um, kind of redirect the sound from my machine to yours and we watch this together word of warning there's a bit of a, a, a somewhat loud jingle in the beginning so we need to watch our volume a bit but let me just bring this up so, so. so um it's actually from 2012, so it's quite a bit older. So, but I think it's still worthwhile, and quite relevant, and actually quite fun um, to watch. Now I need to get this right here. Um, redirect my sound. Um, by the way, I, I'll post the recording for this on this whole issue there, uh, but I ho hope it got the message across. Uh, bear in mind, this was a bit older. This is like, like eight years old now, but it's still kind of a, a musical uh, video for, for two reasons. First of all, it's quite, a, quite nicely animated. Uh, uh, and um, the fact that the um, presenter speaks uh, even faster than I do, but um, so, but it, it, it showcases some certain ch challenges associated with games, right? And the uh, need to kind of accommodate players to changing strategies early, and kind of the challenge levels also encourage them to take certain risks, not just to uh, you know uh, exploit strategies. Uh, they know. So there's a bit um, in, in, in another context, we're talking about the differentiation between exploration and exploitation. The idea that you exploit a known strategy for success, but it usually means that you have a low risk, uh, but also a low reward, relatively speaking, in the game. But if you at earlier stages in the game also have a high risk, high reward strategy that you embed in this based on exploration, try other things. Uh, in worst case, different combinations on your uh, game pad, if you talk about uh, from a gamer perspective. But if you think about choices, in your game that you can actually have uh, engage in more sophisticated challenges. Uh, for example, think about a fitness app or something like this that you engage in a more uh, uh, um, um, challenging set of fitness routines, but you only get the reward if you complete those successfully. Um, then you need to find a way of nudging players uh, successively into this one. So it appears that it was their choice, but it certainly you want to, want to do it so gently that it doesn't appear that they suddenly hit that famous brick wall when they actually no longer have the um, the, 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 the you know uh, weekly performing strategy at their avail because they're simply too far. Uh, in the progression and this kind of continuum continuous adjustment for um skill level uh, is particularly pronounced in serious games that's why i just wanted to play this up a bit and showcase this uh, as part of this video if you don't uh, follow the reference to those specific games it doesn't really matter but i think from the context you could infer what the features actually are right so that they are um, um, um you know um, items that are um, uh, probabilistically provided to weaker players based on the observation that the game makes in order to give them uh, have some sort of balancing factor so they can uh, you know score points while they're actually skilling up to the more advanced players if you wanted to anyway that's basically just uh, that idea are there any comments or questions about this um, ah, there's again a game uh, a discussion going on in parallel, so examples for different uh, forms. Okay, I think uh, one of the uh, final concepts that's also very report, uh, important is that people often don't necessarily thrive based on uh, monetary rewards, points uh, uh, alone, but on status. So what's status in contrast to points? Or oh, it's linked anyway. Yes, I get in the chat, I get some feedback here, that's good. Yeah, it's it's showing your ranking, right? So it's putting actually um, your your own position into perspective in the uh, context of the entire game, right? So and that's usually done in form of um, 
I mean, in worst case, on, in terms of points, if it's individualized, badges is one way of doing it as well. So you don't necessarily have a comparative notion, but you know you got a badge for something, doing something, right? So in primary school, they get badges if they complete a particular task and so on. Uh, but it, it, of course, allows for comparison, but that doesn't necessarily need to do so, especially in online settings. It's easy to isolate, if you like. But then you, of course, have the more formal status characterization on leaderboards. And that's exactly what uh, Benjamin said just now, this kind of a ranking that you have embedded in there. So a set, set of status uh, that you uh, are involved in, right? So, and they can have positive effects and negative effects, right? So sometimes having leaderboards can be good for community building. So you know that people engage, they know each other, they have at least reference points, even though it's not the real names of the playing uh, players. But if it's badges, it's good from an individual perspective, but you don't have this community effect or may not have the community effect if there's no way of communicating um, this. So status is a quite, quite important one. Um, yeah. So um, the final point I just want to get, because we are running a bit out of time, is that the mechanics, of course, can be used to some extent for, for good and bad, right? And we didn't really talk about good and bad at all, but I want to leave you with a set of examples um, that, that, that at least uh, put a um, question into their value. And um, this uh, typically referenced to as the meta game in the context of game development, you know, what's the game actually about, right? So, I mean, we know for entertainment games, in most instances, it serves the purpose of monetization, right? Mediated via uh, community building, right? So you're in a large enough community, so a minuscule income based on, uh, you know, um, uh, loot box or whatever else uh, you want to have uh, um, generates enough income to um, sustain uh, running and developing the game in the first place, right? Uh, and other means, but there can also be other objectives. And knowing this meta game is actually quite relevant um, when you look at the games and analyze them as well. That's why I want to bring this up. Um, so monetization is the obvious one, the cheapest one. I mean, ads, uh, as you might re earlier referred to ads as a means. Well, they're, they're, they're of course not so much a, a means, but you want to keep the players engaged uh, and endure ads to some extent if you want to monetize on them. And not that this would be a motivation for serious games in the first place, but what probably is more relevant is in serious games that you have notions of data collection. So people actually, um, uh, um, uh, um, you know, may, may actually use the serious game to actually collect data, as we'll see in a given example, um, for research purposes, for example, or of course, just for monetization again, that we'll learn more about you, for example, and share, sell data sets or uh, alike to that. So that's, that's something you want to bear in mind. Um, something that's um, a bit more in, I think, uh, sometimes less obvious, but more more, more, more um, ethically challenging is um, games that s intend to sway your opinions, right? By actually subtly sending uh, or signaling political motives or directions. We get into that as well, a few examples of that. And then, of course, we have awareness games that are not made for monetization, they're often free, but actually want to raise awareness of uh, causes and so on, right? So there's um, diff different forms of kind of uh, meta games that people uh, play. And again, this is not a finite list, but just a few perspectives that you could think about when you look at games and wonder, okay, why do they do this? How do they finance themselves and so on, right? So um, for example, in awareness games, often it's like NGOs that have some sort of uh, funding from elsewhere or rely on donations in order to fund their activities, right? So the, the monetization is of secondary uh, uh, role, but nevertheless, to some extent, um, works. So the rule is here, follow the money, then you probably know where a particular activity, uh, what a particular activity is driven for. So, and um, uh, one earlier example, very early example, uh, is uh, to learn about um, uh, protein structures. And the idea is there that people could participate and basically puzzle uh, with um, um, uh, globally in the community and kind of um, create uh, uh, candidate proteins from scratch, which uh, uh, allowed some kind of innovative insights about how you know proteins could be designed uh, from the bottom up. So basically, you want to use this community effect or the crowd effect uh, in order to facilitate and promote their and drive their own research. But fundamentally, the underlying intuition was data collection, right? To collect data to get a better understanding of uh, how protein design actually looks like uh, and so on, and then publish this, of course. Folded was one example of those as well. So um, I get back to some references later if you want to look up uh, more on this one. A news game example that's really worthwhile mentioning is um, uh, JFK Reloaded. So a bit of a, 
uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, the, the topic seems to be reasonably obvious, so I don't think there's any need of going deeply into this and uh, discussing the issue. But of course, you know, uh, the, the, the idea was basically in this game to replay um, the, um, you know, um, JFK assassination, which, as you may imagine, uh, is quite sensitive to, um, you know, um, considerable, um, you know, people of, of uh, particular US Americans, I would imagine, and so on. So it has uh, sparked a lot of discussion um, because it, um, uh, as far as I recall, it was um, to the, for, you know, the anniversary in the widest sense of the um, um, execution of JK and so on. And the idea was both to uh, share information about this event, but also, you know, do it in a form that is engaging with the player and that has attracted serious criticism and visibility was very visible at that time. I think this game is like, uh, yeah, it must be 15 years ago or something. So quite a, quite a dated one, I think 2003, in fact. Um, another example, which is probably more contemporary because uh, not so much because that very instance that I'm showing you, but because it's actually, uh, was really used for um, um, uh, recruiting activities. The idea uh, of the game America's Army was actually to play a classical combat Counter-Strike style combat games with two, um, you know, teams, you know, the good guys, the bad guys, of course, and they fight each other. And it basically was uh, produced by the U.S. Army, uh, or at least financed by the U.S. Army, in order to attract new recruits, because the idea was to simulate or show the realistic, uh, you know, um, um, setting of, 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 of uh, battlefield uh, um, situations and so on. So, uh, and there was a consider it was considered quite propagandistic in the sense that it would, of course, sway the me message of, you know, us being the good guys and the others being the bad guys and so on, that kind of stuff. There was also quite a tricky thing. Um, it was actually, uh, um, um, you know, playing usually um, U.S. Army against terrorists, but it didn't matter which position you played because if you played either side of the game, you would always play as um, um, a U.S. Army member or soldier, not as the terrorist, but you would see the opposing player as the terrorist. So however you played the game, there was always the perspective bias towards the U.S. Army perspective. So quite interesting example of propaganda games in the widest sense, if you want to name it as such. But that could be considered a serious game in the sense that it had a secondary purpose beyond pure entertainment, even though entertainment is, of course, of course at, at, at face value, very pronounced in this particular uh, game, as you may imagine. Awareness Games Fiscal Ship, that's an economic uh, uh, game, you know, how to run a country. This is actually more like an NGO kind of uh, uh, um, um, uh, um, game, which may not entirely right. There's, of course, some sort of political uh, emphasis behind it, but the idea was basically to run a country. Uh, that was just reinvigorated uh, uh, in the light of the recent election, the fiscal shift kind of to balance uh, income outcome of an economy and so on. And uh, here also get awareness about, you know, how complex an economy actually is uh, and, you know, what the aspects are that you actually need to consider in order to um, be successful um, running a uh, economy. Jon Gunnar, question, point? I just yeah like uh, while uh, you were showing off some examples of the uh, uh, games, I just remember that um, I did come across a good example of a series games, which is uh, Water Battle by Grendel, Grendel Games, which was like made to like teach people to save water and use water efficiently throughout the day, and not just when it's the most convenient for you. Because, yes. like, uh, in some areas, there was, like, a problem for, like, the uh, water suppliers to ha have enough, like, it, there was, like, some, they could see during certain times of the day that the throughput of water was much higher than others. So yep. there was a game made so that people would take showers when they usually don't do that and stuff so that the water would be so what the user will be equalized throughout the day right okay so an actual um yeah awareness as well right so falls in the awareness kind of educational game i guess yeah that's an interesting one i think it's worthwhile to um bear that in mind and uh, pick this up again um two things i get back to this there yeah, i have a resource i added a resource section uh in, in in the wiki perhaps you can add this game there or reference to it or link it can be very brief just for you know to, to have it handy because that sounds like a very interesting relevant point I get back into topic areas in a second. Um, I think I'll conclude it here for now. So there's a lot of those kind of games regarding to awareness, propaganda, news related, and so on. They kind of intend to sway and play 
different meta games just be, beyond you know the monetary obvious monetary objective that we commonly see um and instead of uh, there's a few more points i want to make but i'll probably uh, do those next week but probably what's more relevant what i just want to uh, allude to uh, for now is that um we need to look at serious games with uh, quite critically with focus on the uh, mechanics in mind that we can use to kind of stimulate people to kind of engage in the game continuously, right? So it's one of them, the major points. And in doing so, we need to find right mechanics. We want to decide whether uh, there, there should be community effects or it should be more uh, individual learning in a way. If you want to afford comparison, how can you avoid competition or only competition? Because if you do too much competition, the challenge is there that you have an operant conditioning problem in the sense that if you stop playing the game, again, no behavioral change, right? As Elizabeth pointed out earlier. So that's the kind of um, challenge that you really want to be aware of uh, as well anytime you think about the interaction of the different dynamics, right? Whether they are uh, uh, come across at, uh, as skills, as uh, points, as uh, associated rewards, uh, sort of upgrades that you can provide and so on. So uh, we talk a tiny bit more about this next week just to motivate this, but I, I hope that you got a, an intuitive understanding at least of how this uh, works. I provide you with the slides, of course, for this session, but I want to draw your attention to um, the wiki for a brief minute. And uh, the idea is that uh, I augmented the um, structure with a new area that are called uh, topic areas, because we're now getting closer to get an understanding that there are different areas uh, in which these games are applied, basically based on the meta game, realistically, or the objectives. And here are some of those topic areas that is uh, highlighted with some resources, sometimes games, sometimes articles, blog articles, sometimes uh, publications all over the place, uh, sometimes also bad publications, but uh, they have good resources, for example, um, and so on. So it's quite a bit of uh, uh, diversity there. And what I would like you to do is in the upcoming week or throughout the upcoming week, rather, to look into some of those resources and perhaps get a feeling of what kind of topical areas are of interest to you if you haven't already settled on any, right? Uh, perhaps there are some certain certain preferences. Jon Gunnar, do you, um, is that uh, raised hand recent? Um, if so, feel, please feel free to speak up. No, it's not. Oh, no, I, I okay. forgot to lower it. Okay, fair enough. Um, so um, if, if you can, throughout this week, just think about, uh, you know, what area would be of interest to you? Because uh, our expectation, as I said uh, and laid out in the earlier two sessions, was that you actually uh, providing us with an overview and insight into those particular areas, right? Because they're very diverse and this list is not finite, right? So it's not exhaustive. If you find an area that you think has not been covered here, so we're listing, for example, education there and specifically training and education that's more skill centered, this is more like a cognitively centered, then cognitive ability, um, decision-making games, health and wellness, news games, awareness, propaganda, technology, general game analysis, if that's something you're more interested in, you wanna look at the dimensions there, it's less information there, so it's something you need to uh, probably uh, um, find um, um, additional resources or who uh, perhaps anyone wants to look more into the psychology of serious games more generally, perhaps more like a meta studies that look at uh, the value of serious games uh, at, at a large scale. Or of course, any sort of category that we haven't uh, discussed at all and you would be feel interested in, that's something to, to think about as well. As part of this, uh, and let's follow up to Jung Gunnar's uh, comment earlier, is uh, you know if you have games, add those. Uh, you're free to edit pages here. You click on that button there and you just need to learn or I guess uh, emulate a bit of um, uh, markup or markdown, sorry, markdown um, language. You can just add your comments there basically, right? So you see, for example, those are bullet points, indented bullet points and so on. You just add whatever you uh, what you find uh, and just, just put it there. Links are represented. You can just paste links in directly. So that's not problematic. It will recognize them as links. Check in the preview that it looks somewhat presentable that you what you want or otherwise refine until it does. Um, that's that's the idea there. But um, it'd be great if you if you kind of take the um so there's actually more documentation down here about how this markup language works but feel free to edit and kind of um, you know provide more resources where you see some or want to share some so i think it'd be really good for all of us to kind of um, um source from this when we get to this section in the next week um we are um, um uh, talking about this a bit more topical choice and um I'm somewhat conflicted as to whether we talk first about psychological models or more about literature reviews, but we'll gauge this in the beginning of next week because I'll ask you, you know, what your experiences are based in your scientific methodology course first, and then we go from there 
as part of our um, session. So until then, uh, please have a look at topic areas and kind of try to get an understanding what you would be possibly interested in researching, both in you know looking for papers, uh, identifying a specific paper that everyone wants to read, and preparing a session on this later down the course. So next week onwards, we're getting closer to this uh, planning of actually you uh, thinking about what, what topics you want and when you would feel comfortable presenting those. So we ran well over time. That's a skill uh, that I have. So I, perhaps if one wants to design a uh, game, a serious game that teaches me to be more on track, please go ahead and do so. Um, any, oh, there's one question in the wiki. If you don't find it in the wiki, sorry, that's right. Um, go to wiki. That leads you to the home page more generally. And then on the right here, you have all different kinds of pages. Yeah, every time I talk about pages in the wiki, I mean the ones here on the right. And the one is called topic areas. That's the one I just showed you. Okay, um, cool. All right, so any questions by anyone? I don't uh, sense any. I think it should be reasonably clear. I provide you with the resources and uh, the video so you can look at watch it at half speed again. Um, if 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 needed but um that's uh, it for today we can pick up on this discussion next week um and then continue from there cool well thank you very much for your attention and uh, i hope you get a um, good week uh, and perhaps find the time to play a serious game who knows <laughs>